Piece ever. <laughs> we were just just now. You're mentioning that you learned the entire Goldberg variations on sax. Not entire. Um, I always do these big projects. Like I'll tell you about other ones, and I get like a part of the way through, and then I then I falter and fade <laughs> away. But I make it pretty far though. So for what, instance, yeah. the first one I ever did, like when I was like 20 or something. I learned Countdown, the Coltrane solo, okay. in 11 keys, not 12. <laughs> I made it through 11. I did that with a bird solo, I, like a big Cherokee solo from like 1943, mm -hmm. where he's, he's not as free and advanced as he got later, so he's playing more like in a way that, you know, kind of delineates the, the bebop style more clearly than later when he's just going crazy. I right. mean, it's better later, but as far as learning, and this is a, Cher a live Cherokee thing, which is great, that I learned in 11 keys also. Do you remember any of it? No, that one, I don't, the countdown I don't remember. I'll try, I okay. mean, I, only in the first key. as far as I can remember. <laughs> Which one of these did you do first, the bird or the... Oh, the Countdown was first. So okay, Col you were in, did you Coltrane Big before? time, big. I was in the Coltrane like crazy. I got um, the one record that I would just like pray at the altar of is the one called John Coltrane Quartet Plays. Right. It comes right after Love Supreme. Yeah. And it's way better than Love Supreme. <laughs> it's, far, it's, excuse me, it's really great. But, um, That's the first one that I know of where the tempo just like falls away and they just go free for right. a while at the end. It's just unbelievable. But so, I, yeah. I stopped being into it because that's not really my personality. I'm, that, that, that heavy minor thing is not for me. But, right. um, but it was for a minute? Oh, man. It totally was. Was that your first I analyzed. Thing? I analyzed what he does. I know what he does. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, it, it's, he pretty much does the same thing all the time. I mean, whoever can correct me if I'm wrong, but. Which is what, exactly? Well, he'll start with, you know, I'll just play, I don't know what key is like. If it's. And that, you know, and, and he'll throw in, it, like for funk reasons, he'll throw in the. You know, the, right, 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 so we can right. get a major third in there. Yeah. So from the four chord, but the next step will be. All that shit. Excuse me. Am I allowed to swear? The next step, as Andrew Renfro, my friend, will tell you, he's the best person I know at doing this, other than me when I used to be able to do it. <laughs> but um, is the countdown. He would go. But he has a certain way that he figured out because he practiced like 100 hours a day. So he figured out this way where he would, that's a descending thing. We yeah. play it where it sounds like it's going up. Right. But I, he fig, I figured that out kind of with my stuff. You have to work on it a lot. You know what I mean? So, so I, I never bothered to go that far into it because nobody ever came close. The only person I've heard who, who really pulled it off was Steve Grossman. Okay. And I heard him do it in Paris and right. it was pretty good, yeah. Okay. So anyway, what were we saying? So where was that in your kind of like development of, was that, that was really like, early for you? Yeah, that was like in my early 20s. Okay. But uh, you know, the, um, the bird thing and the bebop thing mm -hmm. came after that. Okay. And I got harder into that after that, so. And then after the bebop thing, I kept going back. 
I mean, I can't remember what, what order that what I did Lester Young if that came first or second, but I did Lester Young, and then I did Big Spiderback after that, and okay. I went really nuts with Big Spiderback. I learned a million solos. I've only, I learned his solos for like a year. Okay. So he's one of my big, big all-time favorites. So with the bebop thing, what, uh, um, I wanted to ask you, like, to you, what does, what is, like, real bebop? Real bebop is not the major scale. <laughs> it's not. It's the chromatic scale and, like, the, um, you know, when they, uh, when they play a, ma a major scale, the major scale in bebop, you know, is, is like a, it, it, it's a seventh chord stretched out. It's okay. the, what they, because they will put the two going to the five, mm -hmm. because if it's just a five chord, you know, like. You know, that's like the older style, you only have so many notes. But if you wanna, I'm oh, sorry, if you wanna play twice as many notes, mm -hmm. you do the. I'm saying you, you do you, you add the upper structures so you got all all the scale notes but just spread out so they squeezed them together and there's a whole lot of chromatic things in it and also what people don't get I mean this is going to sound like a rant and just like a, a like a you know that's okay people can turn it off because they want to. They you know probably, a, a gripe about youth you know but um <laughs> and it's not that because I found this when I was young I found this you know it's like um it's like Dizzy said it's all about the rhythm. He thought of the rhythm first, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? That's always been a big thing for me. So, so there's a lot of chromatic notes in it, but it's all about the accents. You know, yeah. that's what people don't do, you know? You know, it's like the triplets, you know? And, and, and the real, like the early tunes by Dizzy yeah. are different than bird tunes because they're like, they're just demonstrations of the actual things that they discovered. Like, do you, do you want me to go through this? The, yeah. Uh, so like Groove and High, for instance. That's a tune that's whispering. Yeah. So it's like. The, uh, the seventh yeah. chord, you know, and the next one is. that seventh chord so, and it just goes around the cycle so what they did is and it's then it goes to the, the seventh chord but they do this that's pure bebop mm -hmm. that's pure bebop and this is a this is That's the blues upside down. So the blues, but the bebop is blues on the five chord, not the one. And those are all five chords, you know what I'm saying? Dominant chord, you know, it's going around the cycle. Yes. They're fives of fives of fives of five. But um, so. I didn't catch the blues upside down part. I'm about to show you. Okay. So if, if you're in like this key. You know, that's a blues thing. Yeah. But they do it instead of starting on this, right? Yeah. They do this because they're going, they're resolving from the from the uh, suspended suspension on the four yeah. to the three. Mm -hmm. But they do, it, but they come down, and you always hear Coltrane doing that letter. I, that, that's what I think it is. That's pure blues. So they're able to infuse like some kind of blues thing into European harmony. You know what I mean? But gotcha. that's that's blues, and that's super funky sound, and that's where you get that flat fifth. So anyway, that you can just like do the look at those early tunes, early dizzy tunes mainly. And see that stuff like this one. Um. That one. Right. Be, be, be. Right. 
that one. Right, right, right. And that's just, it's so cool, though, but it's real, like, you know, clearly laid out to exact, you know, bird tunes aren't like that. It's a bird. You know what I mean? His tunes are like more like genius inspirations that he did it in the bathtub before on the way to the session. You right. Know? But it's different. The Dizzy, Dizzy is much more methodical, and he's greatest. He might be my favorite of yeah. all time. I mean, he might be my favorite horn player, period, even with all those other guys. Wow. I think he's my favorite. I could play you recordings to show you exactly why. But um, Can you name a couple yeah. for people to check yes, out? Yes, I can name one. Yeah. There's a record. 1945 is the best. Like this is right when they were like, Bird hadn't like gone to the mental institution yet, and you know broken down in California. This is like when in 45 they were playing the Three Deuces on 52nd Street, and that's when the bebop thing like, like, like critics were just calling it Chinese music and like a bull in, in a China shop, <laughs> right, right, things right. like that. So that's when they that's when they made all those tunes with the arrangements like. You know, like Groove and I had that thing in the middle. You know, like I had, and, and, and um, Night in Tunisia was a big long arrangement with all these different things in yeah. the middle. And, and like, and that, that tune, uh, um, sh uh, Blue and Boogie, has all sorts of great stuff. And if you want a recording of it, there's a live recording of Bird and Dizzy at Birdland. Mm hmm. From later years, a kind of a reunion gig. Okay. And Blue and Boogie is on that, and you can hear the whole arrangement. So they had, it, like, Bebop was a big show music. It was, like, really entertainment, because they had all this great Parts, backgrounds. Yeah. Like, like, um... But, the, but they had a shout chorus. You know, like, like just great, great things that, that they played together. It was yeah. a big show. Bird jettisoned all that. When you hear his his like quintet gigs in the like forty eight or whatever, mm -hmm. the, he doesn't do any of those things. Okay, it's some of them, but mainly he just Place. blows. Yeah, but it's interesting. When I came to New York in eighty three or whatever, Junior Cook, mm -hmm. who's you know was was he would go out to all the sessions. Like there would be these certain jam sessions at these little clubs that he, he would be there and um he was so nice and he and he would play and he would play these tunes but he knew all the dizzy big band arrangements. Right. So he would be throwing in all these different backgrounds and and it was so cool man it's, you know so that that you know that's a big part of it whereas bird didn't really bother with that i don't think i mean right. i'm I, I wasn't there you know but what's your favorite charlie parker solo um well i have these solos that i learned probably the all-time greatest on record for just like sheer like brilliance mm -hmm. is um the, he does let um lester leaps in on this live thing like in the late 40s, maybe 1950, which is just spectacular. Mm -hmm. Like, look that up. It's just incredible. But um, I learned these solos right when he got out of the um, out of the mental institution in 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 uh, L.A. Mm -hmm. He made this record and it's called Home Cooking originally on the Dial Records because it's like there's no melodies on it and he plays like half speed and it's so beautiful and it's so perfect the way he places the chromatic notes you know when you have a whole step the particular whole steps that he put the chromatic notes in between is just like perfect like yeah. the structure of his solos my favorite records by him are like um you heard of dean benedetti i don't know he was a saxophone like in those days people who heard charlie parker would throw their saxophones, you know, right. in the garbage, yeah. <laughs> you know, because it was just like, so he, it was so great that he inspired this one guy, Dean Benedetti, was a sax player. Okay. So he's de he devoted his whole life to making recordings, live recordings of Charlie Parker. Okay. And um, there's one particular one from the, uh, from the Onyx Club in 48, where he like, and you'd be interested in this, where... Like, they tell stories about Charlie Parker, how he would do anything, and he was, like, real wild. Mm -hmm. But then you hear, the, like, the, the studio records, and he's perfect. He's wild, but it's not, like, anything crazy. Yeah. This thing from 48, by the, from the Onyx Club, 
is crazier than any Ornette Coleman record you ever heard. And he he had to sneak in the clubs because he didn't have any money. He was just like one of us, you right, know. Right. So he like. He, he would find places to hide the mic so the club owner wouldn't see it. All so right. this particular place, he stuck the mic like in the floor. So the bass notes, Tommy Potter, are louder than anybody else. So I <laughs> recommend it to bass players. You hear every note that he okay, does. Okay, I, I don't know if I awesome. have that, yeah. Is that just available? That's an album? It's, it's available. It's on like, you know those... Um, those big box sets, such with an M, the, the name of the company. Wow. Mosaic. Right, right. I, remember I those, always yeah. get it. It takes a while. I'm a slow mind. But, um, yeah, the Dean Benedetti thing. So there's stuff from California, which is, everything is great. But the stuff from New York is unbelievable. And especially he did 52nd Street theme. That was his theme song for yeah. the end of the set. Yeah. And they're all different. And they're all crazy. And I, every other solo was cut out, which is the way I like it. As right, much as I as, solos, as much yeah. as I like Miles and them, it's just 100% pure Charlie Parker. And that's it's cool. Incredible. So that's my recommendation to anybody. And the recordings are, like most people, are immediately turned off because the recordings are so bad. Right. It's hard to listen to. But not for me, bro. Gotcha. I listen to it ad nauseum, man. So you were crazy about Coltrane, and then you got super into that stuff, and and, and, then what and Big Spider back. Ralph but Bix, but at yeah. the same time, and when I was in the Coltrane, I was super into Hendrix at the same time. Okay. And Muddy Waters from nineteen late forties. Okay. I was just as into that. I would go in the bathroom, and I would take this, you know, a nice big old timey speaker, you know, old timey now, and like put on like, um, Voodoo Child, Slight Return, and just blast it in the bathroom and it's you know it's like <laughs> <clears throat> you know so that I love just as much so I'll tell you the story that's how all my system came about if you it was from Hendrix Hendrix and Coltrane and Bebop okay I mean you want me to demonstrate or you let's do it okay so yeah <laughs> because I'll, I'll explain it in Pittsburgh I was into Bebop but as a lot of people know and no offense to my buddies but Beboppers tend to be like elitist pricks you know who, totally. just, who just look down on everybody who doesn't do it and in Pittsburgh you know everything is much lamer in these smaller cities <laughs> so these guys were assholes and elitist and not that great you know so it was like <laughs> I wanted to play bebop and learn it but they tr treated me so condescendingly I just plus it was no fun you know like like Hendrix you, you read interviews he says it like in 1965 when he was struggling he was up in Harlem going to st like sit in at clubs and he said these old guys just want to play how high the moon all the time mm -hmm. you know so it was even old at that point I'm talking about 1980 something so, right 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 or 79 I or whatever so I started get playing jam sessions with my rock and roll buddies you know okay because we could just go nuts you know just get super blasted on weed if, if that's allowed here and just go <laughs> crazy and just like play free and have the time of our life and make tapes and go home and listen to them and, and think about how great we sound you know which is great you know so so we would play like you know just a dominant chord so i was into the hendrix thing <laughs> He was chord as the sharp nine chord, yeah. but I would I would treat it like a bebop, which where where the for the flat fifth is equal. You know what I mean? So it's like, and but but then that turns into a diminished because bebop is about the diminished scale. So so anybody else might be playing rock. I'd be going. All this crazy stuff on diminished, but yeah. over rock. Yeah. So, so that was more fun for me. So I was all, I'm always been into the dominant chord over everything. Right. And all my tunes are just pretty much basically dominant chords. Right. But that has to do with Bach too. With Bach. Yeah, because I was also in, in, into that, into like, like Bach, I like, when I, classical music, I've always preferred the sm like chamber music, like a string quartet or a solo piano. I like the you know like the fewest voices possible. Yeah. And when I made my music, what I did was the I, there would be a bass line against a you know a top a melody line, mm -hmm. no chords. I played trio for many years, and um, so the bass would be a melody, and each note would be the root of a dominant chord. It okay. wouldn't be going through like 
like Western voice leading harmony. The only voice leading was the sevenths going down or up, you know what I mean, in okay. the middle of the chord. So, so, but, so each bass note represented the same chord, so you could, just, so you could base the whole thing on the, that root, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, and then on top of it, Everything was just dominant all the time. Dominant chords yeah. and every kind of different sequence. So it would be a melodic line in the bass. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? As opposed to like, I mean, Monk kind of like did that first, you know, but as, as opposed to like. Which songs did Monk do that first? Like if you. A lot of them, right? No, his greatest, his most advanced thing, the thing that pre, what's the word? Precursors. Uh, it, it, it like. It, it, it leads into what I do. Yeah. Is what he does on on T for two. Okay. Have you checked that out? Yes. T for yeah. two is like he crunches a cycle. This is Bach kind of thinking. He he makes a cycle go through the whole thing. Yeah. And he doesn't do it for l pretty reasons. He does it for like funk reasons. Yeah. And it's all dominant chords. Right. You know, and he'll do a speed them up and slow them down to fit the way he likes it. To right. me, that's one of the great things of all time that's my one of my favorite accomplishments of all i mean but like a, a lot of his tunes like that san francisco holiday does stuff like that and you know he did that he, he'll, he'll substitute things like on sweet and lovely how he goes down chromatically mm -hmm. but things like that that's more that you know in my alley i, I like i like formal mathematical structural theoretical like like cubic like analytic cubism the like the 1911 like Picasso stuff. Mm -hmm. There's no no colors involved. They okay. got into colors a little later, and it's all about the form. And Ulysses, which I love, is like formal. I think there's tons of form, like blatant, you know, in it. You know, I, I and, and I thought, you know, I mean, jazz came along late, so it was way behind those art forms as far as that. So I I wanted to infuse some of that kind of thinking into it. You know, but I, I mean, Beethoven is is like. He's he's super melodic and funky at the mm -hmm. same time. Like, he never lets you down, you know? <laughs> I, I recently went to the Philharmonic, and they played the Leonora Overture. Mm -hmm. And it's the intro is the longest five chord of all time. I mean, just like scales and nothing. And I said, man, come on, bro. I mean, you know, <laughs> give me something. And Beethoven replied, I'm about to give you something to blow your brains out. And he <laughs> did. And it was like I was in, literally in tears by the end. Wow. Because it was so great, man. And then everything that came after was just like just garbage for me, man. <laughs> Berlioz. I just hated all of it. It was like, it's like, you know, like die already. I hear you that. know, the romantic music is like, that. wow. But um, anyway. What about the Goldbergs? Oh, man. I could explain all that. Goldbergs is the most. I, this is the universal. This is not my only. Sorry, I keep bumping that. It's not my opinion only. This is universally known, but maybe not among jazz musicians. Maybe no, no know jazz musicians so. don't know anything, <laughs> including how to dress, or including how to make breakfast or whatever. You know? But um, <laughs> all right. <laughs> but um, jazz musicians just the only reason they get into jazz is so they don't have to get up to go to work in the morning. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> or the only reason they get teaching jobs, you know, like you, you find them at, at Juilliard teaching is because they can't get a gig playing. It's the only way they can make their living and have health insurance. But I would take it. Give me a job, too. So, <laughs> but um, so what was I saying? Oh, the Goldbergs, it's a tune with set changes. You mm -hmm. dig? So this right. is why I was into it, because it's like jazz, because it just... You know, fugues, they just go all over the place. Yeah. And, I mean, I don't know about them, but they have their form. But it's this not gonna is help a, us too much. Yeah. It's a variation. So this is like the same 32-bar structure yeah. for the whole thing. Right. So he, he just demonstrates his various things that he does. Mm -hmm. And it's structured. So every third one is a canon. Okay, yeah. And the third one is a canon. Like, so it would be three parts. The bass is free. The bass does what it wants. Okay. But the top two are strictly locked in. Strictly in the rules. You can't break the rules. And like the first one is an exact it goes um And and right there the next part is 
it's an exact imitation mm -hmm. of the first part the whole way through, mm -hmm. through the changes. The changes change, but the, you know, it's like the, 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 um, the, Technical skill, right? Is just like ridiculous. It's like you know, godlike, you know. Right. So, the th sixth one, every three, the sixth one is an imitation, a step away. Okay, so the so the first part, one goes yeah. like, and the second one is, I mean, a step as far as diatonic, mm -hmm. you know. The, so the ninth one is a third away. And the twelfth one is a fourth away. And upside down. <laughs> okay. It's unbelievable. I mean, it's just like, this is like as good as a man can possibly get as far as intelligence and in pulling something off. Right. So the next one's a fifth, sixth, seventh, all the way back to a, an octave. Right. And you can analyze it. Yeah. It's just, That's pretty mind blowing, huh? And the bass lines, his bass lines are the best. Like this guy from Cream, Jack Bruce, mm -hmm. the bass player. He says his main influence on bass is Bach, because he grew up being a cellist. Mm -hmm. And he's right. Yeah. The bass lines are great. Yeah. Pure funk, syncopation. That you get, there's no loss of, like, if you're a jazz musician, the rhythm, and, and these guys from that era are experts in three and different multiples of three, nine, 12. They're, they're so good at three, you know. What do you mean three? You know, like the time signature. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're just so great at it. Because the thing is in three, it goes on. Um, wait. I think it's in three. Yeah, 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 I know what you're talking about. But anyway, so... So there's like all sorts of multiples of three in it. And I especially love nine because there's no two in that. It's three times three. Mm. Nine is the coolest key time signature of all. I have a tune that I put nine in. It disguised it, but I actually got off a nine on one of my tunes. Right. Yeah. So you were also in a Muddy Waters? Yeah. 1948 and 49. Okay. It, you know, the rest of it. I mean, that's his golden period, you know, and I'm sure Keith Richards would probably agree with me, you know. Right. That though, that's, um, yeah, I, I love, love whatever you want to call it, deep blues, mm -hmm. whatever you call it, Lightning Hopkins, you know, Howlin' Wolf. I mean, I love it. Yeah, I love that stuff too. Yeah. So how do you play the blues? On saxophone? Correctly. Yeah, on saxophone. You can't. You can't? That's why I took why up not? the guitar. I mean, if I had a guitar here, I'd show you. But right. it's just, it's, I mean, Charlie Parker and Lester Young are supreme blues musicians and Dizzy Gillespie. But you put them playing a solo and it's great, 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 great. And then when someone follows it with a guitar and just plays that one, the neutral <laughs> third or the, or the fourth a half step, like a quarter tone sharp, and it's over, man. <laughs> piano, not, you can't touch a piano. They have to do this to to make a uh, right, to right. make an imitation of yeah. the of the half of the neutral note. But so why is that the guitar? It's, it's the key. I, it started because of the overtone series, mm. and that's the way people in Africa heard music. You know, they heard like they shaped their mouth. I think in the form that would that would be consistent with the actual physical notes of nature you know? right so which is a third between well the third it comes up it is like flat so yeah and um but it's also in the seventh is also really flat and the um and since the blues this is i'm going to get involved with this since the blues is a combination of the one and the four if you put the one Seven chord here, and you put the fourth subdominant chord here. The seventh lands on the third, but the seventh is really flat. So you have an area of the third that's like, like bigger than a step. So and and and, and Hindemith also says in his book, theory book that the, the third is like the most like you can't tell the difference between the, where the major and the minor third like change to each other. It's a funny note like that. Yeah. So yeah. So you're saying that say you're in C, and so you have the F below it, the seventh of the F is, is e, e, flat. e flat, and that's really flat. That's like seventh is flatter than the third is. Seventh is like it's a hundred cents per half, per half, a half step. Seventh is like thirty six flat. Right. So it's almost halfway. It's almost halfway to the sixth. 
Gotcha. You know what I'm saying? It's 14 away from that. The uh, the third is is 86, so it's only 14 flat. Yeah. I can't believe you know all this. I do, man. <laughs> I do, man. I do. That book. There's a book I read that's like the basis of my theories. It describes it all. It's called Africa in the Blues by this guy, Gerard Kubik, who was in Africa for 30 years okay. recording people. And do you think he was he had the correct idea of what the blues is? It sure works. You know, what he says, sure, like... Which I, is that? It, it could what be, he said, No, or? what he said was, first of all, the uh, Africans who were transplanted, by far the vast majority of them went to Brazil. Because if you look at yeah. Africa, Brazil comes way out here. I mean, Brazil comes way out here, and here's Africa. So it's a much shorter, in the Portuguese or whatever, there's a much shorter distance. Mm -hmm. Brazil, and then next would be the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And they all came from, like, the west of Africa, which is, like, Dahomey tribes. And, and please, anybody who knows this stuff well, excuse my ignorance if I'm saying it all wrong. But, any, but the Dahomey tribes are the drum people. Mm -hmm. So, like, there's no blues in samba, mambo. They have no idea. Right. What no, the blues yeah, is. Yeah. They have no idea. And like and in and you know, I saw a thing with Dizzy Gillespie saying that that so anyway, I'll get to that. So in North America, which is up here, that Africa comes out here and this is Dakar here, right? This is like and there's like an infamous spot, like with a little point where they like the slaves came. But the slaves supposedly that went there came from central Sudan, which is not a drum culture. This is a more harmonic, and they were connected to the, the Moorish um, Arab, Arab culture, mm -hmm. which is all about what they call it melisma, like, ah, yeah. you know, like notes, hold notes while you <laughs> like, I? Ah, <laughs> I love that. So they were connected with that because they were a thriving thing back in like the Middle Ages, what we call the Middle Ages. So, right. But he has field recordings that show that um, that the people of Central Sudan is the area. The women, like the overtone series, forms a ninth, the dominant ninth chord. Yes. That's, yeah. So it's four through With nine. Sharp eleven, right? Fourth, sharp eleven is number the eleventh partial. Yeah. So it's not. It's halfway to. The, it's like halfway between four and the sharp eleven. The eleven. You know, it's like it's like a quarter tone exact. Okay. It's forty nine between, uh, you know, on the 100, so... We're getting pretty deep here. But. Yeah, well, you know, they can rewind it and listen <laughs> to it again. Either that or just never listen to it at all. But, um, the, uh, so what happens is they have this duality thing where the women sing a melody based on that in, say, G, and the men sing the exact melody, the same thing, in C. So it's two keys at the same time. Wow. And that's exactly what blues is. Wow. It, it covers everything. And, and then he shows... I want to hear what that sounds like. Yeah. Listen to a blues, bro. Okay. <laughs> no, I meant that. <laughs> <laughs> listen to it like... Any, listen to Lightning Hopkins. It, you know, it's like... I'm saying it's those you notes could right totally there. Totally do it on the yeah, side. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, um, so so that's so he got anyway. It's real detailed. It's not some mystical. You know what I mean? He's like scientifically mapping it out. So right. And you know, and like I was saying before, Dizzy Gillespie was saying that the slaves were, you know, the they were outnumbered their masters by so much that they were so afraid of insurrections because there were slave and in Haiti they had a revolution that they won so that was like a nightmare you know they were that was a big thing in the 1800s huh. people that freaked people out so they were so afraid of them communicating that they didn't let them have drums or anything right so that's one theory but there's all this theory too so I, you know, I like this theory because it's like so scientific, you know, and I, and I go from there with, with, with my series. Right. So. Okay. That was pretty awesome. I don't know where to go from there. That's why, that's what happens with my book. I don't know where to go. I can't figure out what, how to put it in the right order, man. It's so like crazy. Right. So how, do you want to talk about your thing then? Shit, whatever, man. You can talk. I can give you the origins of my thing. Yeah, I'd like to hear that. Okay. All right, so we were talking about Coltrane and Hendrix, right? Yeah. And Bebop, so those three things. So you know a Love Supreme, right? Mm -hmm. So Love Supreme is this, and this is in my book what I call 
a blues triad. Right? Yep. So that's a blues triad because the middle note is the seventh and a, a, a regular triad is. But this one you change the third to the seventh. So that's that's a blues triad. So it goes down. Not well, I mean, it, it, it just root, it, it, yeah, basically, yeah. yeah, yeah, right. So um, but I was into the flat fifths of the bebop and the diminished. So I made I was fooling around on flute. This is when I lived in Pittsburgh, and I made a scale that I liked. It was this, and Coltrane doesn't do this, which is a flat fifth away. Right. So the scale is. So that was a scale I was messing around with. Right. I was also in the bar talk in Schoenberg. I, I just wanted to be innovative, you know? Like, when people, like, you always see these interviews of guys saying, well, we're not trying to be innovative. It's just what happened. Bullshit, bro. I don't believe that for a really? second. Really? <laughs> I think everybody who's innovative wants to be innovative. Okay. That's my opinion. Maybe it's just me, because all I cared about was being Mozart or Beethoven or Bird. I wanted to be innovative. I wanted to be one of those guys. And that's why it's such a drag being white. Bang. Sorry. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> so anyway, you can leave that in there, by the way. So. <laughs> I certainly will. Okay. So, um. You know, they can pick you out at night. It ain't easy being white. So um, <laughs> that's what Jack McDuff used to say. So um, where was I before I ruined everything? You were talking about the two triads. Before I became a are, part of the QAnon and then you said party. You talk at Schoenberg. Okay, so, I, you know, I, I love the idea of 12-tone music. And I also love the idea of directional. Like, like. Do you like how it actually sounds? Yeah. Okay. But at the time, it was just as much the idea of 12-tone mm -hmm. as how it sounds. I love how it sounds. His piece is now more than anything. Like, I find it pretty, whereas most people would just pull the record off. You yeah. Know? So, but, um, so there's a piece by Bartok, which is one of his great pieces. You know the thing called the uh, music for percussion and celeste? Yeah. So the first movement is this thing, like th this one line. Like it's like a four or five note motif. Yeah. And then he does. He does it through all the keys, and then he gets all the way up a flat fifth away, and they hold the note, and then they do it upside down, like, like coming all the way back. Okay. It's just one of those things, like the box stuff, like an, an accomplishment of math. That's of just, nerddom. But it's so great to listen to. Okay. So it's just incredible. So that whole upside down, I actually wrote a, a, a tune, one of my tunes called Whatness of All Horse, where I used that and then I turned it into a, I filled it out the 12 tone. That's all 12 notes. But I used those first four notes of his thing to make that tune. Okay. But, um, so yeah, so I love the directional thing. So I had moved to New York and I was in my apartment just by myself fooling around one day. And I, and I went. And for some reason, God, whoever gave me this, I'm telling you, it just came from nowhere. I went. Sorry. <laughs> I can't play this thing, man. <laughs> Was that a thing you got from there? No, Sorry. that I got from some other source of <laughs> stupidity. <laughs> Which is that upside down. You understand what I'm saying when I say upside down? Yeah. Third, yeah. third, third step, half step, going down. Right, so the same intervals, but going down. And that was a, yeah. and it was a twelve tone row. That's all twelve notes, and that was the lightning bolt that changed the rest of my life. That my my whole life is based on that moment. <laughs> I swear it is. Every record I make is some manifestation of that. Okay. Every I have. They're all on Bandcamp. Go. You don't even have to pay for them. Go listen to them. Motherfuckers. So. <laughs> so yeah. And so from there, what happened? From there, I worked on it. 
I worked on so it. So that you could I play. worked on it so I could, I wanted to figure, I, but then I figured, I figured out each step of the way, those weren't the roots. That's not the proper spot for it as far as what the roots of it are. And it took me years and years. To, I, I hesitate to just give this all away. Oh, yeah, you don't have to. Yeah. No, I mean, I can, but so I, eventually, I, so I started writing tunes with it. So the first tune I came up with had this in it. What I love about it is blues because it's it's flat. It's all flat fifths. And this is the this is the other one upside down. The same thing. That so that was like the first thing I did with it, and and then I would put chords under under it. So it, it's like. F7 and then the F sharp 7. Mm -hmm. So, but so the chords were just standard, like it's like, well, you need, you know, right. standard chords, but the, it would have this, this, and, the, and then, and then I wrote more tunes like my theme song, and these are all 12 tone. And if they're flat, the fifth, the flat fifth is equal, so the next one is the same thing, but a flat fifth away, so. And the chords change accordingly to the flat fifth thing. So that was the next tune. And then I came up with, then I figured out that the thing was built out of triads. So I came up with this tune. All my tunes are like a, the, like a Euclidean theorem explaining my latest discovery of what this, so then one, then one of the next tunes is this. I remember that one. And yeah. here's another one. So that I kind of switched them around, but that's that's a, um, I wrote that on piano, and then I put so so there's that. So I discovered that was one thing I discovered, but I was also working on um, on chord on the harmonic part on on, a, on the harmonic thing because the thing that I that my music is based on and what Dizzy said all bebop is based on is the cycle. Mm -hmm. You know, the cycle of dominance, yeah. you know, where the, um, where the third and the seventh go down chromatically. Yes. And, and, and Monk does that, like when he go, you know that thing on, on rhythm changes where you go to the F sharp, B, yeah. but, but you know, if he, Don Bias will go. You know, he, in the scale, Monk does. He just doesn't. He doesn't do scales. You know that's what yeah. I like about him. Yeah. He rarely plays a major scale, like like I, he plays two fives, in a completely different way. Right. A, a, this is a digression, but you know a two five like. Right. Monk doesn't play the scale. Monk sees that A minor seven, as a C six. Same notes. Yeah. So he'll he'll do this. So he'll play it as a six and play in the key, like blues in the key of C major. Right. And then to do the thirteenth. So, so I love. He's like my favorite soloist, also. But um, so where was I? Um, okay. So I was working with changes, and one of the things that I got, did I get it from classical, was. Instead of playing, you know, like, why not just do that going up and play chords in fifths? So instead of going, yeah. you go. So I did that and I wrote tunes with that. So, and my my uh, pattern goes through the cycle. So if I want to go in, if I want to go in force, I go. Right? But if I want to go in fifths, I go. And, I so, it, yeah. and so eventually I learned 
but I wanted to. I liked the um, the idea of playing in two tempos at the same time. And I'm not sophisticated at all when it comes to off tempos, other than three. I'm great at three. But if you get past four and you go into those funny prime numbers, I'm done. As is shown on my son's record. But, but um, anyway. Shout out Charles Gould's record right now. Oh, man. He's made a great record, yo. It's good. But um, How do you improvise with that 12 tone? Now I'm about to tell okay. you. So, so the first thing I did. I, I, you know, I wanted to put it over chords, but I put it over stand. So I would put it over chords, but there's six notes in each thing. So it's not four. So I wanted to, to make 12 notes equal two bars, mm -hmm. equal eight. So I had to play it in triplets. And I, I went, made this elaborate thing, like, because I, it's like, you know, people aren't going to understand this, but the, the pattern is this. Oh. Um, what am I thinking? Okay, if I, if I do the down one, the one that I showed you, the one that the first thing I said was when I did that, the actual roots of that is that's what that's the root note as far as even though it's going down, that's the root note. Mm -hmm. But um, but that's made up of this. That's made up of a diminished chord, right? So I, 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 I took that and I, and I constructed a line that went in four, but changed in three. So, so, this, so the, tune that, the first tune I came up with is called You the Man, named for my hero, Patrick Ewing, at okay. the time. He's still my hero, but um, E.W. the Man. Because I was watching my Knicks on TV, mm -hmm. and he had had a particularly good week. This is like local MSG. And, and, and they were showing his stats, and they put on top, you the man, <laughs> <laughs> Patrick Ewing. So, so my tune is over a blues. This is another thing. Blues actually is a cycle, so, but I could explain that too. But, um, so here's the tune with that going. But for the first thing I did, let me go back. Can I, can I go back? Is this we can crazy? Go back. I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. Okay, so You're blowing my mind. I wrote yeah. a tune called my, another basketball reference. Michael versus Mikan. You know who George Mikan is? Not He's really, the king of early 50s basketball. Okay. A big, plodding white guy. This is when no black guys were in the league at all. <laughs> so there's a whole bunch of white guys shooting these 30-foot set shots and doing hook shots That's kind of your game, left and right? right. Yeah, man. I mean, I do with a regular this. But, um, you know, and, but so... He doesn't get any credit because he, he, he was in it that era before all the smooth ass, you know, like Bill Russell and Wilt came along. So, but the tune is called Michael, Michael Jordan versus Mikan. Because so like the first part is his plotting like, and th this goes through the cycle, fourths and then fifths. And it's a blues too. People don't realize that. <laughs> Can I play the piano? I'm not going to be on, on screen, no? Um... You can, but uh, sure. I'm not sure how well it'll be heard, but. Oh, there goes my water. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> Off beats. So I learned a solo over it, right? I would practice. So that's just, and, and when you solo, I don't play scales at all. I just play. So it's like just to arpeggios. Yeah. And, I, and I, it's like, like monk style, so I, so I have to improvise. You know, it's like the rhythm thing, but I would, those, are the, uh, those are the notes I would use. So I did that, and then that's the mic in part. Then the Michael part, I, I did it with those, my, so I did it with this.
So it's those scales. You get it, what I'm saying? Yeah. We're going through those chords. Right. So the, so the improvising, where the other one is like, like that. The improvising on this is, uh, how does it go? Uh, I have to play it tomorrow. Um, uh, oh. So I'm, I'm just as limited on that, but I'm limited to those six notes as right. opposed to the arpeggio. But, but it's like, like Dizzy said, it's all about the, since I limit myself to six notes, I have, I can't play pretty. Right. I have to, I can't hear like beautiful melodies. I have to do something funky because I hate beautiful melodies anyway. Right. So it's like. So like, your whole thing with this is to. It's, it's like, it, it, like I wrote in an early diary entry. I said, my thing is not about originality. It's about objectivity. I want to be objective. I don't want to think about Coleman Hawkins and Lester Young and what would Bird do here. You know what I'm saying? Because I learned all their solos. You know what I'm saying? So I learned. At one point, you did like that, I guess. I still love it. Okay. <laughs> I love it like... You know, that's Lester Young. So I learned all this stuff, and I can do it, but I hate myself when I do it. So Why? Because I, I just hate it. I just hate, like, I just feel like the biggest idiot doing it. So so with your tunes, you, you, you write them with a specific improvisational goal in mind, and you have certain rules that you, when you play yeah, over them that yeah. you have to do And then when I, when I get on the gig, you know, I'll, you know, be feeling good, and I'll, and I'll figure, let me give the crowd something, you know, they can... That can comfort them, you know, and give them some major scales here and there. How do you feel about major scales? I mean, I, they're great when Gilbert and Sullivan use them, but I think they stink for jazz. Why? It's just not an African thing, man. It's like, it's just foreign. Even though I, I, I hear these old, you go see these African things and they're singing major, kind of majory, but I just, it's just an artificial thing that's great when Bach does it. And, but the beboppers, like I told you before, they're not playing, but the people, people like ran with the major scale and turned everything into major scales. You know, it's like, you know, like major scale is like, it's like, and Coltrane, when he's got like, I love Coltrane when he was all high on heroin and drunk. He's like, I love him in the 56, but when he got off of it and, and you know, he's like playing that sheets of sound on that to me is like real, like, like, like no rhythm at all. Mm. You know, I mean, I'm not saying I don't love like those Atlantic records and stuff. I do, you know, I think he's the greatest, but Almost, but um, <laughs> but uh, anyway. So major scale just doesn't sound good to me. It's like really sappy and and corny, man. It's just even even Bird and and, and Louis Armstrong. I, I think they're just the greatest, but I just it doesn't appeal to me. Mm. Like if I go to a Gilbert and Sullivan show, that's great. Why? How could? Why can they do it? Because Gilbert and because so Arthur Sullivan was the Mendelssohn Award winner in 18-whatever. And he's like, he knew Beethoven, Bach. He knew this stuff inside and out. Mm. And I love Jerome Kern and, like, them, too. You know, like, they use major scales great, but it's in a kind of a different way. I just, with jazz, I think it's, you know, it's like everybody plays in minor all the time now. Yeah. It's easy. It's just easy to be, like, so lyrical in minor, you know? And jazz... <clears throat> Sorry. You're good. Jazz, where's my water? Jazz is based on blues, man. And blues, you know, it's like, it's like blues is the minor and the major at the same time. Mm -hmm. So if you play in minor, you're just removing half of the music. It just, you know. Right, so how does that apply to standards, though? How do you play standards, then? I mean, standards, like... Like Johnny O'Neill says, man, you got to give the people those show tunes. They love those shows. And I agree. They're beautiful songs. They're real catchy. You know, there's no jazz musician, musician other than me who's like written like, like a, I mean, I've written a couple of tunes that could pass as standards. They can't do it. You know, it's like, and even mine are kind of, I mean, maybe one, but they're kind of weird. But, um, 
you know, those standards are just like, and especially by the the guy, the real guys, they just like great. You know what I mean? Like I play on this this gig on Saturday nights where the guy does the Frank Sinatra book, and we yeah. played the Nelson Riddle charts, and that tune. Um, from this moment on, yeah. forget it, man. Like on the second half of the bridge, when it lands on that major section, it's just like, like that's uniquely great. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And this, like, mil I've there's lots of those tunes, but it's always the ones, or almost always the ones by those particular guys who had the stroke of genius. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Cole like Porter, Cole Porter, Irving Berlin, Harold Arlen. Yeah. I'm just saying the ones that they write that we do are. And I've done, you know, you play them a million times over the weeks. Yeah. And those are the ones you always come back to, man, that are better. Like, because they'll do tunes like Fly Me to the Moon and they, and they're just not as good, man. Right. You right. know what I'm saying? But Or like Nice and Easy Does It. Like these tunes that were written a little later. Right. they just they're not the same. Yeah, they're formulaic. It's not. Just, they don't, they're just not as inspired. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know what, it, I can, you know, I can't explain inspiration. Because my favorite music since 19... 50 or whatever is hip-hop from the late 80s and early 90s. It was just a, like some kind of thing happened, you know what I mean? And then it went away, but mm -hmm. I could listen to that all day. Right. So, okay, so where was I? Let me keep going. Um, well, so, I so, want to ask you one other thing. Go ahead. You said you got to give the audience what they want. Do, do you actually care about that? Um, you were talking about it in the context of playing a major scale um, standard. No, because um, if you do what I'm trying to do correctly, they dig it. So you definitely you give them something what they want. If you're if you're smart enough and you're doing what you want, mm -hmm. because it's going to be just as entertaining to them. Because me, I don't care about like, you know. I mean, I love Schoenberg, but the thing I care more about than anything is funk. You know what I'm saying? I like James Brown. I uh, like monk. These people like do funk. They don't do major scales. You know, I like that's what I like. So people like that. Like I play blues guitar now. Yeah. People love the blues. It yeah, just, of course. You know, everybody it, loves the blues. Why? This is my book. Why do they love that? Are you? No, but I'm, I can try to explain that. But anyway, let me. So I, I want to hear you try to explain that. I mean, because it's I think it's because it's based on the overtone right. series. Right, it's man. Not, it's more. I think it's physical. It's less removed from. But it's also what natural it's music. All, is. But it's also a miraculous thing to put the four chord and the one chord at the same time. It's like because because it proves all these up up down symmetries. Like my scale that I'm showing you, yeah. is just an extension of that. I didn't find that out till recently. It's just. It's just the next step of that. Okay. So what I do is pure blues. Mm -hmm. Even Ari Roland, my friend, once said, you're just playing your style of blues. And, yeah. And it's true. That's all I like, you know? Like, it, you know, it, it, I just, I'm not crazy about... Like, I like Dizzy Gillespie because he, he plays all these chromatic notes and all the super funk things, man. It's just like the rhythm is just so... But the record, you told me to, I'm going to do it now, the rec recommending a, a particular tune, Seventh Avenue. We never got to this for some reason. In 1945, Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie, they, were, they weren't known, so they were making records as sidemen with other people. Mm -hmm. And... Um, they're on this record. Trummy Young is a trombone player who's like a swing guy, really okay. great. He played with Louis Armstrong's band and stuff. So it's him and Don Bias, like this incredibly all-star, like all-time sax, I mean, horn section. And there's a tune called Seventh Avenue where like Dizzy is like, he's just so laid back. His groove is just the best. I just love, I love, love listening to him. And, he, and he's, he's humorous. There's nothing serious about him, mm. you know? It's just beautiful. Yeah. So, you want me to keep going? I can, see, I told you last night, I can go all day with this stuff. I, I, I can't speak on the mic at a club, but I can talk on this forever. <laughs> So, I mean, I can keep going. It seems like you're, like, flagging in your interest here. No, I'm interested. Okay. But I'm just wondering, are we going to, at what point are we losing everybody in terms of the, the well, complexity you, of what you're talking about? There you about. go with the audience. Well, you can keep this for, you know. For posterity? Okay, keep going. It'll be like my records. You know, people will listen to them, hopefully, in, you know. A thousand years? After years. I'm moldering in the grave. <laughs> 
to give you a Civil War reference. Okay, so 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 I would do these tunes. I, I, so I took this pattern, and then the next one would be. No, that's not it. That's wrong. But anyway, it would be that upside down. And I came up with this thing. So the eventual tune that I came up with is "Over the Blues." You, the man. Mm -hmm. So it went like this. I can't even play now. So that's the four chord. It goes around a cycle, and it just, my thing just keeps going up, 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 stepwise. But that's that's a that's a tune that I fashioned to be sound in four, like the accents and whatnot. But the actual notes from the patterns are changing every three beats. Okay. So I came up with that, and then so then, and then I found a way on standards. I just decided it's like a collage. I just would like put it together and have landmarks where they hit together. But, but it'd be like that monk thing on T for two. It would be a cycle. But the difference with the monk thing is everybody's doing it at the same time. Right, whereas you, the rhythm section is just playing normal and you're doing your thing. Yes. And it la lines because up. Because right this so thing is, as you can see, is so wild and so different. It's my, if I want to be innovative, you know, like usually innovative things in jazz, which happened a long time ago, the whole group was innovative. You know, bebop, every yeah. instrument was going along with that. With me, I can't, and, and, I, and I read, I'm reading a book about Rameau, who also has a theory that he wrote. I, that was his favorite thing, that he, he did modern things over established forms. You know, right. so that's what I do, because, you know, I, I think that the bebop f format, you know, I think that's what I like, so I just, I just, in this way, I don't have to teach anybody anything. You know, I just like right. play my thing over top of it. And and, yeah. So. Do you think the internal logic of it makes it kind of satisfying to listen to, even if people have no idea what it is they're hearing because it's maybe. mathematical? Maybe, maybe. Also, I've just worked on it so much right. that I have it down pretty good. Yeah. But no, but when I do it, when I do it, the rhythm elevates. Yeah. Everything gets funkier. So. And the funny the thing about it is, when I'm doing it, I feel like it was more so in the past, especially like in, when I first started doing it, it was horrible, man. Like, I just thought it was awful. But I, you know, it's but just- you just did it anyway. I had to, I, I, cause, cause I would make tapes, and when I would play the regular, you know, I'd be like, pretty good, but you know, you'd much rather hear Bird doing it, you know what I mean? I hear you. But as soon as I went into my thing, I could, that was the timeless thing. That was the thing that you could listen to forever. Huh. So I knew that was a fact. So when I make records, no matter how horrible they might be, I'd rather make a horrible record than just a regular old record. Right. right. So that's what I did. And it came out well. I, I'm very proud of, of my body of work. I got a lot of it. And each record, is a, especially later on, is a different way to approach those six, 12 notes. Right. This, but the same pattern, and I could explain. I could take every record and explain it. I could explain every note. How many records do you have now? Thirteen, and that's a lot more than the old days because CDs are one hour long. Right. So it's like a record and a half at least. You right. Know? And my last record is the first record I made. It was like twenty minutes. But you know, these days it's about singles. So you know. Right. So that's a that's a, like an obsolete form, the CD length record. But it was it, the LP was shorter. But but it's, it's like a nice form to adhere to just for that purpose. But it's over, man. <laughs> I mean, it is with the sing it, singles are fine. Right. It's fine. You know, but that was kind of fun, like. With the CD, you lose the concept of side A and side B. That yeah. was an interesting thing too. But, yeah. And I, some of my records, I do side A and side B. Yeah. You know, even though there isn't one, at least one of them, anyway. Do you still like listening to jazz? No. No. I mean, I'll listen to those records I'm talking about, yeah. like if I hear Dizzy Gillespie. But if I hear guys that like all these people worship, like I just think like people who like imitate this '50s hard bop, like. You know, so it's like, it's like second-rate music done in a second-rate way, which equals four, fourth-rate. 
<laughs> you know, either multiplying or adding, it comes up the fourth. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, like, to imitate bebop, for real, yeah. you have to come up with your own system and play it like you. Right. That's the imitation, not doing what they did. To imitate them for real. Yeah. And that's what I try to do. And unlike them, I don't, the rhythm section is the same, hopefully, as what they had. Right. So that's the difference. And you know what? I have to live with it, you know. That's cool. Because otherwise, it's I, just going to be garbage. Saying, it's just going to be bad, you know. Yeah, if you're trying to do it with someone else. And I don't expect suck. some bass player to be playing 12, my system in 12 times. I know. I, I'm not doing it. That's Nobody sure. is. Nobody on earth is. Yeah. Thanks. But, um, <laughs> you know, like, but my most recent thing, like when the pandemic hit, for some reason, you know, well, my guitar player who played with me for five or so years, I played at Fat Cat 15 years every Wednesday, yeah. which, is the, one of the, which is a great thing where you can develop your music. And I had the same band, you know. Yeah. At, you know, so I, all my records, a lot of them are all based on, on the developing of the material from those live gigs. So, yeah. so a, a guy, my friend and, and your friend, Andrew Renfro, he, the only people I usually hire show a lot, not always, but show a lot of interest in me, you know, so, so <laughs> they like are interested in my music. So, yeah. so it's like, oh, wow. Cause you know, I generally hate myself, you know, so if someone gives me some kind of reinforcement, it's always great. So he used to come to the gig and then the piano player I used to play with Sasha, some, he had to go away, so I, I wasn't using him anymore. And he's great. Yes. And he was great for all the years. And there's, I have records to prove it. So, but anyway, I did this guitar band. And, and, th and after that, a short while after that, I picked up guitar myself. Yeah. And I even would bring it on the gig. And you can imagine I'm playing with the greatest guitar player on earth and me being the worst. It was kind of intimidating. But he was very nice about it. But so... What was my point, man? I don't remember what my point was. So why do you, why did you pick up guitar? Like why do you love playing guitar so much? Because we already went I over guess, that. I guess the blues thing. Just yeah, and I love the yeah. Beatles too, man. I, I I like see Beatles. It's this book I'm writing is about non-European harmony. The Beatles, they're playing blues harmony. Like like European harmony, the no no is parallel movement, right? Yeah. What's more parallel than like blowing in the wind? One, four, five. You know what I mean? Right. It's all Just triads moving that's, up and down. Yeah, and that's what my music is like with the dominant chords. Right. So it's a different thing, man. And that's why blues and, and folk music just naturally go together like that, you know? Right. And make rock music. Rock music is like using the using those theories like that theory, not not um like like the Beatles. They're to me they're most distinctive quarter, and not just them, everybody in the 60s, this is the distinctive quarter of the 60s, is like they're playing like a major song. Yeah. They're playing G major, but F major is in there a yes. lot. Yeah. That's a blues chord, man. That's like a blues right. thing. Right, or folk music thing. Right. Folk doesn't use it that much. The first instance I had heard of it is Bo Diddley. You know, he, he would go E, ba, 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 do, bo, ba, E to D major. Because mm -hmm. I was wondering about where that came from, because the Beatles use it like crazy, but it's like, it's one of the chords that's in the palette just as much as like five or four. Right. It's very interesting, man. Right. But that's blues harmony. You know, I, you know, I'm sure they use it in classical like crazy as some other Neapolitan or whatever thing, but, you know, this is different. Those guys don't know anything about harmony. No. So... That's blues harmony, and um, I have a whole—I have that all written out too. And I'm sure, like, it's probably completely just like some kind of weird, you know, conspiracy theory on my part, <laughs> just to, just to, you know, whatever. But can you dis describe like why, just what it is about the Beatles that you, you love so much, or what makes them so good? I mean, well, I first of all, I am a Beatle maniac. Right. I, I was know that. I was five when Hard Day's Night came out. Okay. I saw it, and I was just as crazy as those little girls who filled the <laughs> arena with urine while they were playing, man. You know, just like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They, I was one of them. I love, like, I remember getting a little, a little book, Beatle fan book, and Paul McCartney had a cigarette in his hand, and I was crestfallen that he, you know, that he would be smoking a cigarette. <laughs> But I love them. But I did not, I, you know, I was a kid, so I didn't hear all the 
the album cuts. I just heard the the, the radio. Yeah, I just heard the famous ones. Yeah. So I didn't get into them until the seventies. You know, I didn't really get into Rubber Soul and Revolver till like seventy eight or something. Okay. So I'm I'm just like a young person in that way. But you know, I'm just. I think that really formed something in my brain, man. Like, they're blues musicians, you know? Like, what they play is blues, you mm -hmm. know? So that's always been, or I don't know. I don't know why I'm such a blues guy. But like I say in my book, I have one little thing I'm talking about. Like, Charlie Christian and T-Bone Walker come from the same town in Texas, and they would grew up together, and they would play on the street together, mm -hmm. you know? And um, I didn't know that, by the way. That's yeah. cool. So, Charlie Christian is just this incredible jazz musician who plays through all the chords and all yeah. the keys, and he's just like Lester Young, and you know, it's just incredible proto bebop. Yeah. Just great. You know, the greatest guitar player for me in jazz, bar none. But um, T Bone Walker basically played one lick for 50 years. <laughs> That same thing that, that that Chuck Berry stole and made into like Lady Be Good. Right, know? right, right. That lick. He made that up with the fourth, like Rarity, Rarity yeah, going yeah. up to that thing. Play the same thing every chorus, every recording, and I like it better <laughs> than Charlie Christian. I think I might too. Yeah. I just love it. It's the, what what is that? You know, that's what intrigues me. So why? Why is that so great? Yeah, that's a great question. Why is that? These guys weren't sitting around like you know with their like abacuses, like adding this shit up. You know what I'm saying? They just right. why, you know? And it didn't doesn't come from science. It comes from like people out in the fields or something. I mean, yeah. what is that? So, and it, and it like that's why I play guitar. I can play one note, you know, and just right. that's it. You know, and, and you can just play that. So you so you can learn to be a blues guitar player without a lot of years of like technical. You know, you can on sax. Right. You know, a, a blues sax player like a guy who's not been playing that long and plays in rock band yeah. sounds terrible, man. But guitar is different. It's the right. only instrument like that that right. I can think of. Right. You can immediately do. Not immediately, but it, after about five years, yeah. you can actually. Do okay. Okay. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, you know. Cool. I mean, I have records where it's less than five years that actually sound pretty good right. you know, on guitar. But. I, yeah, I think it's interesting. I can pick it up and play something and it's. I'm telling you, man, it's such a beautiful. And yeah. you could just do it with finger picking, yeah. playing major chords. Yeah. And it sounds like music. Yeah. It sounds like actual music. Yeah. So it's a different kind of thing with guitar. Yeah. Like piano, if you play a bunch of major chords, it doesn't sound, yeah. it doesn't, it's not as sophisticated it for some reason. It doesn't sound good, yeah. It's that string, like plucking the string. I don't know what it is, man. Yeah, that's that's an ancient instrument, you know? Guitar? Yeah, like it goes all way back. You know, dividing the string, Pythagoras, all that stuff. Mm. So anyway, it's my favorite. And I'm so, I'm so ecstatic that I can play it. It's the little that I do. Huh. I just love it. I'm so happy with myself. To the point now when I see people my age and they're like these virtuoso great. And I said, yeah, so what? You've been playing that thing forever. Let me see you pick up a new <laughs> instrument and learn it. Then I'll be impressed. <laughs> it's true, man. So uh, let's change. Whatever, man. Change I'm topic. sorry. I apologize. No, this is great. I apologize. This awesome. Put this on the tape. I apologize. <laughs> so your sons, Charles and Albert? Charles and Albert. Two of my favorite musicians. Great. Who, just, just great, great, great. Who is the better musician? Charles <laughs> is the better um, all-around sideman picking up, you know, like he can do, can do any gig. He's yeah. a drummer. He can do any gig. He picks up other instruments. He can do all that. Albert is better than anybody <laughs> as far as like sorry charles than me you know i'll you know and i never give up anything to anybody he's just an inspirational genius as far as writing songs as you know yeah definitely writing songs and lyrics but he can he only does that right 
He's like me in a way. I'm versatile like Charles. I can do other gigs and hate them when I'm doing them. But I can do other gigs. And people don't give on other people screw me on other gigs anyway. You know, they don't let me they think I'm good, but they don't let me do what I want to do because mm. they're afraid I'm going to ruin their gig by doing something really wild. I mean, they could maybe they could say something that I'm just a negative asshole. I don't know. But anyway, do you object to the nickname Negative Ned? No, it's okay. Yeah, I don't care. Okay. I mean, the guy who who I remember giving it to me is the guy I love, Jack McDuff. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, he's he's like we actually had a nice little relationship, me and him. But um, no, Albert is like his music is, is like. Like in other words, I go to I go to I in, in, inevitably get bored at gigs and any and I'm talking about cl great classical music, jazz, anything. When I go to Albert's gig, I never want it to end. I just want him to keep going forever. I love and maybe it's because I'm his father. I don't think so, but I kind of feel that way actually. I love his music. Yeah, I love his music. How did you raise two musicians like that, man? I didn't do it, man. I did not do it. Neither of them are saxophone players. They do what they want, man. And, and Charles, this is what I always say. Charles, when he graduated high school, I knew he was a great musician. He was great already. He played with me at, you know, in clubs in New York from the age of 14. Right. How was that when he was Great. Started? <laughs> he couldn't do anything technically, but he always grooved his ass off from day one, from when he was eight. He's got a, he's got that groove thing, man. He definitely does. He just grooves, and he's like, he knows how to groove. Yeah. Which is rare. Sorry, and um, so. You know, he he went, he was a good great cross country runner. Yeah. In New Jersey, and um, so he he got a scholarship to Temple. Um, what do you call it? A um. Track and field. Track and field, but the level is um, something A. Uh, oh. Division one, whatever. D one, yeah. For track and field, yeah. college. Yeah. This is very high stuff. Yes. Yeah. So he got that. They, and, and and all he did, and I knew that he was a musician, but I didn't tell him to go somewhere and major in music because I wasn't going to be the one responsible. Yeah. For him ruining his life to be a musician. So, <laughs> so I did not say anything, but the whole time. He just practiced playing electric bass. All he was he was just into music the whole time. And he ended up quitting and becoming a musician. Mm -hmm. And I was so proud. We moved in, we had lived in New Jersey where they had went to high school, but we moved back to Manhattan. And I was so proud of the two of them. They were living with us. They were like 18 and 19 or whatever. They both, Charles would go out and play on the street with like rappers he ran on the street every day mm. and Albert went to open mics every night wow so they, they were like this was not no encouragement from me whatsoever so if anybody ever asks me or congratulates me on that I say it wasn't me <laughs> the only thing they got from me maybe was some kind of internal talent but they didn't I, I I'm the least Authority when it comes to kids like if they would do something like get a bad report card or get in trouble with the cops or whatever I would say man god damn. I don't feel like thinking about this right now man. <laughs> Can you stop doing it? Because I don't, I don't feel like dealing with this. It had nothing to do with discipline. It was just leave me alone man. You know, this is a pain. I got other things to think about that's funny and it worked Everybody compliments me on what nice guys they are, you know, so they are great guys. Yeah, I'm telling you Who's your favorite athlete of all time? Roberto Clemente. Why? When I was 11, he was on the Pirates. I didn't even... Do you, yeah, do you know Roberto Clemente? Yeah. The one of the all-time greats. He could throw someone out on a dime from, from right field mm -hmm. at third base. He could do it on the fly. Someone trying to stretch a double or a triple. Yep. He did it regularly. So in, in 71, I grew up in Pittsburgh. I sat in the right field bleachers... And in those days, it was general admission, so you get to the to the park three hours early, mm -hmm. and you sit in the front row. And he played right field, mm -hmm. and he's one of the greats of all time. Definitely. So seventy one, he won the World Series single handedly. He was a contact hitter. He was a average hitter. He hit a bunch of home runs to win in seven games over the vaunted Baltimore Orioles, who had like four twenty game winners. Okay. And like the Pirates won all on his back. 
incredible. Talk about a clutch guy, Put man. Put the team on his back, huh? In the World Series. Yeah. His only chance. He had won in 60, but he was like a rookie or something then. But, yeah, and I, I was there for the whole season watching him right there live. That's awesome. That is. I, I'm so, I go on Instagram, and I have this thing, baseball history, and I've commented about that, and people are like, <laughs> in awe, bro. I mean, that's awesome. Like right. the, for the real reason. And I like Pat Ewing. Mm. Pat Ewing made my whole 90s and late 80s and 90s gave me so much pleasure, man. I love you, <laughs> Patrick Ewing. Awesome. I love Pat Ewing. Nowadays, um, I mean, I, I, I'm a sports junkie, but I don't really have anybody on that it level. Gets you like that. Well, I mean, I don't have any rings. I haven't had any rings. I mean, I, I got into the Mets. I got out of the Pirates because I was a New Yorker, so I got into the Mets, so 86. But I'm, I don't consider that, like, my real ring is 71. That's my only ring. If the Knicks were to win now or the Mets to win now, that would be another one. But I haven't had a ring since then. It's kind of hard, but that's, <laughs> you know, it's the way it goes. All right. I think we're just getting to the end, but to kind of... Sorry, bro. I, I apologize for all my rambling. This is great. Okay. But just to kind of go backwards, um, maybe in the order that we should have done it, but what was like... Well, how did you start? What was the first thing, sax-wise, yeah. music-wise, that... Uh, how'd you get started? What was the first thing you heard that really captured you? I think there was a, a 45 single called Big Red. There was an instrumental sax single. I, that could be wrong. But just thinking back, that was the first sax. I didn't start on sax. I started on recorder. Okay, in school? Yeah. No, yeah, no, in lessons. And then in school, I played flute. Okay. And there were like 53 girls and me playing flute. <laughs> so I switched to the saxophone. And I played baritone sax in eighth grade. And um, I kind of showed t talent for improvising, even though I didn't know anything. I had a, a natural talent for improvising mm -hmm. from, and, you know, grooving from the be beginning. So I always knew I wanted to be a musician from that point. Wow. There was never any question. Wow. That was what it was going to be. Cool. I hope you enjoyed this incredible interview with the amazing Ned. Yeah. Come and uh, oh, check out his records on Bandcamp. Check out his book coming out on YouTube also. There's a check, book. check him out on YouTube. And, uh, yeah, that's that. Uh,